Today, we are returning to a Christian channel called Indie Thinker. Apparently, it's a channel made up of more than one person, but you would know it from the fact that there's only one person talking, and the audio mix is so bad, I can only imagine he mixed it himself. Either way, this is called Indie Thinker, and if they are a group, this is the question they're offering us today. Is Christianity dead in America? Well, no. The answer is self-evident. No, it's not. And I don't think anybody would actually say that that is the case. But they have to beg the question, so let's let them beg. I think the rumors of the demise of Christianity in the West will be shown to be greatly exaggerated by those who sadly root for it, and I would say stupidly root for it, without realizing how many privileges have actually been afforded to them in this Christian nation. They may despise it, but they do so at their own peril. You can call the church toxic. You can create your own interpretation of the Bible. It's a free country. But don't for a second think that Christianity isn't the thin line keeping you from hopeless, godless, secular nihilism. Relative to its own population, Zuckerman ranks the top five countries with the highest possible ranges of agnostics and atheists. Sweden, 46 to 85 percent. Vietnam, 81 percent. Denmark, 43 to 80 percent. Norway, 31 to 72 percent. And Japan, 64 to 65 percent. A 2023 Gallup International survey found that Sweden was the country with the highest percentage of citizens that stated they do not believe in a god. I am shocked. I am astounded that America is not number one on the list of most happy countries. After all, out of all those countries listed, we are by far the most religious. We are by far the most fundamentalist Christian. It's almost as if this guy and people like him have no idea what they're talking about. We also have an easy case study right here in the good old United States of America. Massachusetts and Vermont are two of the least religious states in the country. Mississippi and Alabama are two of the most religious. Surely you would expect Alabama and Mississippi to also be among the happiest and healthiest of states. But no, they are near the bottom. Guess which ones are at the top or near the top? That's right, Massachusetts and Vermont. The least religious states are the happiest, healthiest places. That's why whenever Pew polls come out warning that America is now a post-Christian nation for the first time in its history, I don't concern myself too much with that bad news. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One, the more scientific advances we make, the more the existence of a creator becomes more rational and plausible. Then uh, why exactly do fewer and fewer people believe in it, especially those of scientific orientation? I mean, the more educated a person is in the sciences, the le I mean, the more their, their field relates to science, the less likely they are to believe in God. Isn't that curious? And I think he is indeed very concerned about it. I mean, this guy runs a, a Christian apologist channel where he's focusing on questions like, is Christianity dead in America? Is the downfall of Christianity a bad thing? He's obviously quite concerned about it indeed. To the point now where I think that we can clearly say that if you don't believe in a God, it is simply because you don't care about the evidence. Maybe What evidence? Show me the evidence. Of course, he'll point to intelligent design creationism, which is, of course, not science and has no evidence. The second thing, uh, the more archaeological finds that we make, they continue to affirm what we already see in Scripture, including the dating that we find in the Bible. Wow, that's incredible. Tell me more. Do we have the walls of Jericho falling? Do we have uh, the Jews being enslaved in Egypt? Do we have the Jews wandering around the Sinai Peninsula for 40 years? Do we have the slaughter of the Canaanites? Do we have Darius the Mede? Do we have any of those things? Well, no, of course not. Some things in the Bible are, of course, accurate. Some things are just historical statements. Even then, they are somewhat embellished, usually. But some things are outright fictional and never happened. Sodom and Gomorrah, another example. The global flood, Adam and Eve. These things uh, never happened, and it's pretty obvious and apparent to anyone who actually understands how the world works. But of course, guys like this, they're just like, well, it's only going to be a matter of time. Hey, man, it's not like people haven't been looking, and we do know where to look. I mean, we know full well where the Exodus story would have taken place. There is no evidence for it. Jericho, we know where the walls of Jericho would be if they had fallen. No evidence. We know where this stuff is. No evidence. And then third, and perhaps maybe most convincingly, God is real. He's changed my life and he can change yours. As I always like to say in these situations, you know what else can change your life? Heroin. Those facts and more won't change because of DEI, ESG, MARX, 
Wow, how many more acronyms do you need to say, I'm racist? Purple-haired activists or trigger warnings. Ah, transphobic and, uh, you know, homophobic, too. That's, uh, we're doing really good here, my guy. I love falling back on these cliches. Look at the smug look on his face, like, ah, yeah, I really nailed him this time. Okay, boomer. They are powerless to provide the hungry soul with a clean conscience and a renewed heart. Only Jesus can do that. Therefore, I think it's a matter of time. Bro, I have a pretty clean conscience right now. I've done some bad things in my life, as I think all of us have, but it's pretty clean. Now, if I were anything like this guy, if I were spreading the nonsense this guy spreads, I would have anything but a clean conscience. It's he uh, who should be quite guilty indeed. Before those who have left come running back and those pastors who have ushered us into an exodus of lukewarmness repent and return to the real mission of the church. They turn their churches into an oasis in the midst of the desert where people can truly find living water. That's why I gladly share good news today. There's hope. Good news, good news for you people, in the words of Dan Barker, but here's the bad news. So this guy likes to lament megachurches and that sort of thing, but at least the megachurches are full. Uh, I am from Kentucky, I am from the South, uh, lots of fundamentalists here. Those churches are either empty or emptying out as their increasingly old congregants just die. Like, my parents' church... The average age in my parents' fundamentalist, Baptist, hardcore, Trump-supporting church, it must be at least, like, 70 years old, like, at this point in time. Um, and, you know, nobody is like, the young people aren't staying. I mean, the youngest people they have there are my family members when they're in town and go. Um, so, yeah, these churches, they're all dying off. The small ones, the, the faithful ones, the most faithful ones are, are dying. The most faithful ones, as he describes it. I mean, I can't judge personally. I think they're all the same. But this guy has a big problem with mega churches, the only ones that are having any success. Isn't that odd? It's because he disagrees with them personally. They're not radical enough for his taste. They don't hate gay people enough. They don't hate trans people enough. They let black people into their churches. You know, that sort of they don't they don't send they don't call ICE when an immigrant comes in. You know, this guy is just like, ah, these churches, if only they were more bigoted, they'd be more successful. Well, they're already the mega churches. What's your problem? Hope for Western civilization. One of the people who share that hope is historian Tom Holland, who will show us today why there may be a resurgence of Christian faith. The Spider-Man guy? coming very soon. Tom, I wonder if I could ask a similar question to you. Obviously, we know you're a historian, um, but I wondered, yeah, for one night only, whether we could invite you to look um, into the future and just, yeah, if um, Justin's thesis is, is correct and that there is this um, resurgence in belief in God, as Justin says, which, you know, will become part of a worldview that includes a whole range of um, philosophical beliefs, how do you see the future of faith shaping out? As Okay, before he answers, uh, I have read his book, Dominion, and yes, this isn't the Spider-Man, Tom Holland. I'm sorry if I got you excited, uh, but yeah, I have read Dominion. I read it a, a while ago. Um, generally speaking, I thought the thesis was broadly agreeable. Uh, broadly agreeable in the sense that, uh, like Dawkins is all about this cultural Christianity thing, I think that, obviously, as society secularized, in the words of Nietzsche, a little bit paraphrased here, uh, we are feasting on the dead corpse of God at this point. I know that's a very dark image, but let's stick with the dark imagery for a second. Um, God is dead. We have killed him. We can't go back. You can't really believe in it anymore. The most you can do is say, I think it's practically useful, which is what Tom Holland and people like him do. They say, well, you know, belief in God, it, it may not be tenable anymore, but it acts as a bulwark against all the people we don't like. Oh, look, there's Justin Brierley, too. That guy sucks. Uh, but I digress. I have to say that because there's one guy here who hates when I use but I digress wrongly. But yeah, so they'll say like, well, we, we can't really believe in God anymore, but we can pretend to because it's useful. It keeps all those uppity folks in line, you know, the transgenders, We the, so we don't have to call them she and her. Uh, when we just like hate them, we don't have to call them like their new names. We can just we can say there's only two genders, bro. You 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 transitioned. Ah, that's cool and all, but you're still a man. You're still a man, my guy. Uh, we can just be mean to everybody and we can justify it in the name of Jesus, even though we don't believe in him. It's practically useful for keeping all those uppity folks in line. You know, the trans people, the queer people, the feminists, the 
I guess black people are always included for some reason. I mean, DEI is nothing if not a shot at just black people in general. Um, immigrants. Everybody we want to keep in line, we can do it. We just have to use some Jesus. And uh, I think it's, I think the thesis is correct that, you know, uh, like Dawkins said, I mean, this, we are still essentially cultural Christians because we have been influenced by the religion. However, people like me, and hopefully people like you, are trying to break out from that by attaining what Nietzsche called the Overman. That's my favorite translation for it. The Superman might be another one, but I think Overman's a good translation. We're performing this revaluation of all values, trying to make something new. We're not trying to carry on this cultural Christianity. We're trying to make something new. That should be the duty of any atheist. That should be the duty of any person who doesn't believe in God. Um, we should not accept that Christianity is useful because it can help us protect ourselves against having to accept trans women as women or whatever else. You know, it's always some bigotry with these people. The world is changing and we are scared, so we have to rely on these Christian dogmas. No, my friends, we do not. We have to find a new way of living. We have to find a new set of values. People like this, they shirk that duty. And frankly, I view people like Tom Holland as cowards. Hell, uh, if Dawkins wants to go along with the cultural Christian thing, which it seems like he has, I'll go ahead and call him a coward too, and I don't care if you don't like that. So, anyway, I just wanted to get that little rant out of the way, that the thesis is basically sort of correct, but it needs to be not correct. We need to actually get away from this cultural Christian, Christian atheist nonsense. Um, you may think it's useful in combating all the groups you don't like, but instead you should be finding a new way of living where you don't have to worry about the opinions of other people on these things. If you hate trans people, you should just be able to do that. You don't need Christianity to back you up on that, bro. But let's continue. The institutional and ideological hold of Christianity on the West fades. So uh, people will, will, will start to resurrect ideas and principles that ah resurrect you like that that was a good one wasn't it christianity has long served to suppress so namely the idea that actually uh, why should the strong care a thing about the weak i mean why shouldn't they trample them down that's the law of nature um well look so i i am not a cultural christian uh i do not identify with that term i do not think i am feasting on the dead corpse of god um, I think that my idea of how we should treat the weak, as it were, I don't even know what that really means, the weak. I assume he means, like, people with Down syndrome or something. Or people like me that have just, like, terrible health issues that just ruin our lives. Um, whatever the weak is in this sense, I think, like, the, how we should treat them uh, should come from empathy. Our empathy should tell us. We don't need religion to say you should care about the weak. Our empathy should tell us that. These debt collectors sure don't care about the weak, though. Jesus. Uh, why shouldn't people, um, why shouldn't men sexually dominate women in the way that they did back in the Roman times or whatever? Uh, uh, because of empathy. Men, if they are into women, should have empathy for women. I must note, though, it's ironic that when he talks about things like this, who at this point are more likely to be doing that and behaving that way? Well, it's the Manosphere people, the Jordan Peterson people, the Andrew Tate people. And these are not secular people. These are not atheists. These are not... These are people who definitely, like, look up to cultural Christianity, or in Andrew Tate's case, Islam. But the same idea applies. These are people who look back to this traditional morality. Um, it was not Christianity that abolished or attempted to abolish uh, these big differences between men and women, that men should dominate women. Um, that was not religion that did that. That was us. That was secular society that did that. And, I, you know, these, these arguments I just find to be nonsense. Um, all of these kind of ideas that have been suppressed by Christianity, these modes of behavior, maybe they will make a comeback. These have not been suppressed by Christianity. What... What Christianity has suppressed is queer people, trans people, stuff like that, you know, women's rights. It has, it has done these things. I mean, look at America right now. The states that are the most Christian, what are they doing right now? They're restricting the rights of trans people and queer people and women. 
Um, they're not stopping the domination of the weak by the strong. They're not doing anything like that. They don't give a shit. And I, th I think the great inhibitor for that is no, lo you know, it hasn't been Christianity for um, a long time. The inhibitor on that is our cultural memories of the Nazis. It's anxieties about what the Nazis did. Now, we are anxious about the Nazis above all because we have the instincts of Christians. Fun fact, the Nazis didn't allow atheists in their ranks. You could be a deist, which was, I think, Hitler's preferred way of being. About 3% of Germans identified as deists under Nazis, if I remember correctly. Uh, but something like 95% of Germans were Christians. It was Christians who voted in the Nazis, not atheists. The Nazis repudiated the fundamentals of Christian ideology. You know, they did... No, they didn't. In fact, uh, Hitler and people like him publicly used the image of Christ and Christianity to spread their hatred against the Jews and other groups of people. They literally did that, Tom. Uh, why can't you see that? I'm sure, like, uh, well, I know why he doesn't see that, because it's bad for his case to say, well, the Nazis were primarily supported by Christians. The Nazis may have not been a Christian organization proper, but it was Christians who gave them the most support. I mean, if you look back to the German free thinkers groups at the time the Nazis came to power, the atheists and free thinkers were usually communists or supporters of the Social Democratic Party. But I'd say they fell into the communist camp more than uh, the SPD camp. So, you know, you're, you're sort of like making a case based on ahistorical information. What you are saying is incorrect. Now, Tom Holland... Whatever he does, I'm pretty sure he is some kind of historian or something like that. But he is he is misusing history here for his own agenda. I think that should be pretty apparent and transparent at this point. The Nazis were not an atheist organization. I mean, one of their slogans was Gott mit uns. Now, I know I can't pronounce German worth a shit, but that means what? God with us? Correct? Yes, I'm sure my Germans out there will know Gott mit uns. Uh, God with us, right? They, they celebrated the strong, they despised the weak. They absolutely thought that um, Jew and Greek were different. Um, they celebrated uh, the, the, the strength of the powerful and they celebrated racism. And so they serve as the kind of the negative image. They, I think, have replaced the Christian mythology. Uh, before Christian... Well, he's wrong. I mean... Uh, that's just a gish gallop of nonsense intended to appeal to his audience. The Nazis, uh, they weren't operating on some strong versus weak paradigm. I mean, they did call themselves the master race. They did think they were the, the greatest race to ever exist. But then there was like the other side of the ideology where the Jews were essentially all powerful despite representing a small portion of the population. That Jews and other groups like them were conspiring to dominate these super strong, big, bad Aryan boys. Um... So, like, it's not as simple as, like, strong versus weak. It's more like they thought very highly of themselves and their own race and used that to their advantage. And, you know, that's their own thing. That has, obviously has nothing to do with Christianity, but, like, that sort of thinking was not inspired by atheism. Again, the atheists were more likely to file into the camps of the communists or the Social Democratic Party, both of whom were in favor of greater equality for all people. It was Christians who voted for Nazis because they were scared of what the Communist Party was going to do, which was bring about total equality for everyone. Now, with the uh, benefit of hindsight, we may not like communism a whole lot. Uh, some of us, I assume, completely hate it, but there's no denying that at the time, the communists were fighting for a world of equality between all people, which the Nazis hated, and so did the Christians, which is why they voted for the Nazis. Christianity was a dominant force. This was the way of the world. Conquering, killing, raping, destroying, and everything. Now, of course, it took time for that to finally uh, wax old, but when it did, the world started to thrive. This is an, undeni an undeniable reality of history. So all that to just say this. I think this guy has a very weird and inaccurate understanding of history, so you can deny almost anything about this guy's understanding of history. If what Tom is saying is true, then I think we can expect a resurgence of Christian faith in the West. Let me give you just a bit. That is a very, very big if. Of information to, to kind of undergird that. Uh, first, anecdotal. I will remind you that in Mao's revolution, he got rid of... 
how is that going to be anecdotal? I mean, in Mao's revel, you know, there weren't a lot of Christians in China at the time anyway, but like, how is this going to be some anecdotal evidence? The four olds. And he um, assertively tried to get rid of Christianity in his cultural revolution. What happened was that in the midst of the revolution, Christianity ultimately remained about the same, even though it was being deeply persecuted. But in the wake of Mao's revolution, once Mao finally got off the throne, um, what happened was an astronomical rise in Christianity. So once the totalitarian and wicked regime of Mao was gotten rid of, Christianity started to surge. And now China today is one of the fastest growing Christian nations in the world. Let's do some basic fact checking, shall we? The best part of my day is getting to fact check dudes like this. So here's what I learned. I learned that in 1949, there were about 500 million people in China. There were something like 4 million Christians and religion Fun fact, had always been highly regulated in China, even before the People's Republic of China, the communist regime under Mao Zedong, was born. So religion has never had it easy in China, but under Mao it probably got a little bit worse, uh, and then afterwards it started getting better because the country became a lot, quote-unquote, freer. Um, the government, of course, still controls most religious organizations because... of course it does. And Christianity has grown enormously into the tens of millions... But the growth rate isn't that high. Like, surveys have revealed that the growth rate is either very slow, I mean, or non-existent, for that matter. Um, now, Christian organizations, on the other hand, report enormous numbers because they need money. They get money every time they say, Christianity is growing in China despite repression. Send us more money and we can go, like, be missionaries and, and preach to the Chinese people and deliver them Bibles and stuff. But no, Christianity may, in fact, even be declining in China. So, very easy fact check, and of course, very wrong. But no doubt, people like him only believe what the evangelicals are saying, and they're saying some really crazy stuff like, there will be 300 million Christians in China by 2030. There won't be. Uh, but anyway, let's keep going. So in, on the heels of Mao's revolution, there was around 4 million Christians or so in China. And now to date, there is around 38 million Christians in China. Now it's still small comparatively to the large population of China, but the growth rate is astronomical. Now, that is interesting to me. He actually didn't give the evangelical numbers, which I've seen some really crazy ones. Like legit, I've seen some evangelical organi organizations claim over 100 million. Uh, big numbers, big nonsense numbers. But the real numbers may be even lower than he thinks because there was a GSS survey set that in 2010 said there were about 23 million Christians in China. And by 2018, that number had declined to under 20 million, which makes sense. There is a historical trend that as countries become more developed, they become less Christian accordingly. You can see this in lots of places. Now, it, it does go back and forth somewhat. For example, in South Korea, South Korea became pretty uh, Christian there for a while, uh, and then it started to decline, and then Christianity surged back to life uh, to be something like 60% of the population, but once more declined. So Christianity, not so big in South Korea now. So yes, China could have some kind of Christian revolution just like South Korea did, and then it could decline again. I mean, these things happen, but the key point here is any time a country becomes super developed, there tends to be a decrease in religion. It's only with the decrease in development that religion, usually, comes back. Think about Russia. The Soviet Union, as it developed, there were fewer and fewer religious people. Then, as everything fell apart and Russia just sort of fell into the abyss, it became super Christian again. Uh, this is how it happens. Even super religious countries like Poland. Poland has always been known for its super Catholic character. But Poland is developing at an astronomical pace, and as it does, uh, religiosity is declining. Uh, Poland has the fastest growing secular young cohort of any country in Europe, as far as I'm aware. All of this does is prove that whenever Christianity is suppressed, it has the odd habit of kind of springing back up. Like but it's not like oppressed in China now. It was oppressed in China for, like, all of China's history, and then this communist government of China you hate so much loosened restrictions on religious practice. Uh, so, no, it's kind of like the exact opposite, isn't it? Like the early church did. But let me give you some statistics that also bode really well for the resurgence of faith in, in America. 
Okay, what you can see on the screen right now is a bar graph that shows Protestant pastors who were polled and where their church was over a span of about three years. Now, 28% of those pastors said that their church attendance has been declining uh, by 6% or more, but 33% said that it has remained within about 5%. And most startlingly is that 39, the majority of those polled, said that their churches have been growing by 6% or more. Now, the And this really conflicts with all the available data we have, or does it? I mean, remained within 5% is a very vague category because it falls on both sides of the field. I mean, within 5% decline or 5% growth. If a great majority of that is within 5% decline, then that's going to be canceling out that whole grown 6% or more thing. And again, you know, we know from the data that uh, church attendance has declined. It's got undergone a massive decline. Attendance and membership have both undergone declines. So, no. This next graph may give you an indication as to why. Uh, and it may give you an indication as to why the death of Christianity in the American West is a bit exaggerated. So there is a sort of death going on, but as you can see from the red line that is plummeting to the ground, mainline denominations are the thing that are really taking a hit in modern America. Okay, so first of all, where is this from? Second of all, this chart stops before 2000. This is religious affiliation by tradition since 1910, and it stops somewhere around, what, 1995? Let's see if we can find something more up to date on this. Well, 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 would you look at this? When the chart doesn't stop at 1995, we see a different story unfolding here. White evangelical Protestants in 2006 were 23% of the population. By 2020, they were less than 15% of the population. In 2006, mainliners were around 18% and went up to 19%. And then they started declining, but finally made their way back up from a low of 13% to over 16%. It seems like the mainliners are the ones having the revival, doesn't it? Uh, white Catholics, down from 16 to uh, less than 12%. Unaffiliated have gone up from a low of 16% in 2006 to a high of 25.5 in 2018, down to 23.3%. And it seems like the lion's share of those leaving have become mainliners, which is sort of interesting, I guess. Um, but, you know... This stuff is very interesting. Yes, that should be good news for them because the unaffiliated have declined a little bit. But then there's the fact that the decline isn't leading to them growing any, which is, uh, you know, sucks for y'all. There is an upshot, however, as religious nuns have worked our way back up to 26% in the years since that 2020 poll. So don't worry, fellas, we're still winning. Uh, but as you can also tell, there is another green bar that's going almost in the opposite direction of that red bar, and that is the Catholic faith, which is quickly on the rise. And then you can see that evangelicalism is dipping a little bit, but pretty much remaining consistent. But a lot of the uh, decline of Christianity... I cannot imagine that he didn't notice this chart is like 30 years out of date. I can't imagine that he just like sort of missed that. Can you? Christianity in America is coming from mainline denominations, whereas those people are rediverting into other. Uh... How hard and how deliberately do you have to search to find a chart that is 30 years out of date? How many things do you have to overlook and ignore to find this specific chart? It really is impressive. I mean, the mainline decline thing we knew about in the 90s, but. Uh, we very quickly discovered uh, in the mid-2000s that it was also hitting the evangelicals. Like, the evangelicals had seemed immune for a while, but by the mid-2000s, we knew. So he cuts this chart off pretty much just before the decline of evangelicalism really kicked into full gear. Very curious, huh? Something about bearing false witness, maybe? This is like evangelicalism and Catholicism. So it's possible that we will see before it gets really dark. Uh, a resurgence of Christian faith, I hope that's the case. Yeah, before it gets so dark that trans people are just left alone. Wouldn't that be such a terrible outcome for everyone?
But even if not, we can see that even in the darkest times throughout history, uh, there have been people who have clamored for and realized the importance of Christianity in their lives, and it has risen in the aftermath of some, some pretty declining times. So there is another reason, and I think this is something that is deeply embedded in the heart of each and every man. Tom will go into it here in this next clip. Okay, I don't really want to talk about Tom Holland anymore. Uh, I'm sick of Spider-Man. Uh, but, you know, it was really great getting to fact check that guy. Like, I love how just, like, panicked and frantic the guy is and how much he pretends, well, you know, I'm not worried about any of this. I'm just here talking because I feel like it. No, indie thinker, you're not uh, indie, a thinker, or not concerned. You're very afraid. It's pretty apparent in everything you say and do. You wouldn't be talking about this if you weren't afraid of people like us winning this battle against Christianity. And we are. Um... My channel's popularity versus yours, I think, shows that pretty well. Have a great one, everybody.